Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is John Hamry, and I'm the president at CSIS. <clears throat> Before we begin, well, we always start with a little safety announcement. We're responsible to take care of you if anything's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen, but if there was anything to happen, Rick, uh, the guy in the middle, you can't miss him. He's got this beautiful glowing pate. Uh, he is going to take care of you. Uh, we're going to, the exits are right here. This is the one that's closest to the stairs that'll take us down to the street. We'll make two left-hand turns and take a right and go over to National Geographic. They've got a great show on right now. We'll pay for it. We'll get some ice cream and we'll have a good afternoon. But uh, please pay attention in case we hear a voice and we have to do something. Um, I'm really uh, very interested and so very glad that all of you could come today. This is a topic of uh, significant importance. Uh, Frank Wisner and I, when we were worked together in the Defense Department, we remember the day when it was just kind of an icy coldness that shaped uh, our dialogue with, with uh, India. And indeed, I remember being in government at the time when India and then Pakistan demonstrated their nuclear capability. And our only policy response at the time was to shut off all relations, because that's what the Glenn Amendment stipulated. You'll remember that, Frank. And we thought, well, there was a strategy, there was an architecture of deterrence in the Glenn Amendment that didn't work, but nobody had plan B. Well, how are we not going to be working with India going forward? And I think that that's resulted in a far more rich and thoughtful dialogue these last 20 years. It really was a, uh, it wasn't frozen, but it was pretty chilly, you know, our relations with India. And now that has changed dramatically. And I can tell you just from personal experience, I, in the defense area, we are now engaged in a level of cooperation I think is unprecedented. Nothing we would have contemplated 10 years ago. And it's really important, very positive. And it really does reflect the commitment of everybody that's here. The people here today have been working in this area. Frank has, of course, been very instrumental. Ambassador Sarno, you've been carrying that flag forward to keep relations between our two countries growing in a positive direction. So we're going to have a very interesting afternoon. This isn't to say that we don't have objections and issues with each other. We're going to. Two very large, complicated countries are going to have that, but we're approaching them now as friends, not as kind of chilly adversaries. And so this is going to be an afternoon. We're going to learn together. We're going to become richer in our understandings of these problems together. Rick, you're going to lead it from here, and you're going to shape the conversation, the substantive conversation. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Hamry. And thanks, everybody, for showing up today for our preview of the uh, India election results in Karnataka. <laughs> no? That's a different program. Next stage over. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Hamry pointed out, um, you know, the, the, the tests themselves were such a significant event, but we're not here to talk about the relative merits, but just to say that, you know, in a lot of ways, that was a, a start, a restart, an, an overused term in this town. Um, in terms of how the uh, relationship has evolved since those uh, very early days. Uh, this to me, you know, it's a very personal story because uh, I think, you know, probably a lot of you have heard my own, my own journey uh, in, in taking over the chair here at CSIS. Um, I moved to Washington uh, 20 years ago with a Russian background from a school nobody had ever heard of and applied around town and, you know, with Russia, you know, the relationship was on a relatively good trajectory. So most places were letting Russia folks go. and. Um, you know, there were, there were more, uh, more people focused on Russia and the Soviet Union in those days than there were jobs. And so giving up my Russia search, I found it out that with India, just after the nuclear tests, there were not that many jobs, but still somehow there were far more jobs than there were available people to take them. So somebody with uh, relatively no background on India, South Asia, managed to get my foot in the door. And in some ways, I think that was a, a terrific benefit. Because as I hear people talk about the enterprise and all these really rough moments in our history, I didn't know any of that. I was too dumb to know any of the negative stuff that had happened before. Nuclear tests, sanctions, all this stuff, and all I saw was a steady progress on improving. So sometimes I'm, I'm kind of portrayed in this town as a bit overly positive on the India relationship, and I think partially that's the background is I just didn't get to experience the negative. For me, it's mostly been an upward trajectory, which is uh, pretty helpful. So uh, I think it is pretty significant that, you know, so far this relationship since then, you know, we've been living very much moment to moment. The backstory hadn't been such a big deal in those early days. 
trying to secure approval for uh, removing the sanctions after the nuclear test and looking for the first defense sales. I mean, there's so many big things that just seem to be right around the corner. Um, but this is a moment, too, when I think, you know, we've got some, some negative elements creeping in once again. And for those that don't have a lot of experience on India, it feels like we've hit a new low point. Things are stalled. Um, it goes from irrational exuberance to incredible depression sometimes. So it's a great time now, you know, 20 years after the nuclear test, to take a look back and reflect. How far have we come? We've got a couple of panels. One, to look at the emergence of the economic relationship since then. Um, I'll leave it to the panels to decide if the test themselves or that moment or that, that period in time had anything to do with what's transpired thereafter. But certainly the second panel looking at strategic, you know, that was a moment when we decided it was time to embrace, it was time to engage, and the kind of things that we're doing today would have been unimaginable to somebody who had just showed up in this town in, say, 1997 and said that within 20 years we're going to be this far along in the relationship. Uh, I think that um, from my own experience, again, without a lot of India background and knowledge in those days, I don't remember such heady discussions about where this relationship would go to in terms of a global partnership, a global role. I, I don't remember that. Uh, that's why I brought in you know, the real experts to be on stage with me here today. But instead, it was more about South Asian stability and building a friendship with one country that we could count on as a democratic, friendly country in the middle of a pretty rough neighborhood. So again, I think I'm, I'm viewed overall as pretty much an optimist because uh, I happen to have been lucky enough to have missed the, uh, the negative times and enjoyed a relationship uh, the whole time I've been working on it that's been uh, relatively positive. So to, to lead us off here, we've got two terrific speakers that have really been in the front row of this relationship uh, going back even before that period. Ambassador Nev Tejsarna, uh, over 30 years in the Indian Foreign Service, served in critical missions, you know, including Moscow, Israel, the UN mission secure run as the spokesperson for the Ministry of External Affairs, an author of nine books, so a very diverse, uh, very diverse set of uh, experiences. And this is not his first stint in the United States, of course. Served here just after the nuclear test, starting in 1998 uh, through 2002. Uh, also joining me is Ambassador Frank Wisner. Uh, Ambassador Wisner was really one of my early mentors there, uh, allowing, him, allowing me to travel with him on many, many, many executive missions to India when I was a young staffer at the U.S. India Business Council. So learning really at his knee uh, about this relationship and, and, and ideas on where it could possibly be headed. Of counsel at Squire Patton Boggs, uh, based in New York, coming down for the event today. Uh, served as ambassador to, uh, to Zambia, to Egypt, to, uh, to the Philippines, as well as to India. And also it served as undersecretary both at the Department of State and at the Department of Defense and uh, sits on a, 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 a numerous boards uh, across, uh, across the United States, including the U.S. India Strategic Policy Forum, Ethan Allen, and many others. And uh, Ambassador Wisner had just stepped down from his post in India, I think, about a year before the, uh, the nuclear tests themselves happened. But, you know, to have him active with the U.S. India Business Council and his, his deep uh, uh, relationships that he had with so many members of the BJP at that time, provided terrific insight as the U.S. IBC was looking to help to try to rebuild the relationship from that low point. So let me first uh, hand the floor over to Ambassador Sarna. Ambassador Sarna, please. Thank you very much, Riz. What a great honor to be on stage with you and Ambassador Wisner. I actually thought Ambassador Wisner would speak first and make my job easier. But uh, and this is when experience counts, and uh, he's waiting for me to speak first. But uh, I'll, I'll do my best. It's a great pleasure to be here with this audience, and uh, in some ways to uh, look back over these uh, uh, 20 years. So I'm glad there's a panel after this where we can go into the nitty gritty, and I'd rather sort of speak in uh, more general terms, because when I, uh, when I began to look at this subject that you had sent out the preview of, I, I realized that this is what uh, uh, it was Ambassador Dennis Cooks uh, who had written the book, uh, which, had, which, was said in, which was called India, U.S. Estranged Democracies. And uh, that book, I think, uh, came out just a few years, three or four years before I arrived, uh, in, in, in the 90s in the United States. Ambassador Cooks was a very familiar figure on uh, Mass Avenue uh, think tanks. Uh, he was usually a very quiet, uh, pensive figure. Uh, and now I realize why. Uh, because he must have been watching uh, all our antics that we were trying to do 
in uh, 98 and onwards to uh, revive uh, the relationship. Because uh, if you re read the book, and I must say I speed read it over the last of couple of uh, days, just the uh, Ambassador Moynihan's preface and Ambassador Cook's concluding chapter make very interesting uh, reading. And uh, he uh, tended to be, I must say, cautious in his conclusions, uh, like most Foreign Service officers, uh, if they value their life, they usually are. Uh, and it's interesting to see uh, what he concluded even at that time. And I have this short quote. He says, with the Cold War over, Indo-US relations could become more positive. It is uncertain, however, that the two governments will take advantage of this opportunity. Even though past problems have completely gone out of sight, they are not out of mind. And elsewhere he concludes, whether the two countries will take advantage of this opportunity remains uncertain. The history of past estrangement has left its scars. So you can see that even in, at the end of the Cold War and after the end of the Cold War, uh, if there was any optimism, it was minimal. Uh, not to put too fine uh, a point on it, I think Ambassador Cooks, when he made up this paradigm of the estranged democracies and analyzed the first 50 years of the Indo-US relationship, I say 50 years because we actually set up diplomatic relations six years ahead of independence in 1941, and this, this takes it to uh, 1991. He concluded that we were estranged not because of any uh, lack of information about each other or because of misperceptions about each other, but because we fundamentally differed on crucial issues of uh, national interest. I need not, to this uh, audience, I need not go into uh, the details of what these issues were over those uh, four or five uh, decades. We all know the harsh realities of, of the Cold War. We know the, how the uh, pact partners needed to be armed to handle Cold War adversaries. Uh, and, and we know you mentioned the SS Enterprise. Uh, we know the 1971 uh, sort of dip uh, in, in bilateral relations. And I think Ambassador Cooks was justified in wondering that how come the estrangement had actually not been worse. And why it had not been worse is what saves us, the democratic quotient. The fact that there was, uh, if you took out, if you looked at a map uh, of the pre-Cold War map and you took out the communist world, uh, you didn't have very much more in terms of democratic size and strength and strategic value uh, than India. So I think there was a certain uh, empathy uh, with, uh, with each other, a certain mindset, uh, a, certain, a certain resonance, which was uh, what meant that you were estranged, but yet you were, you were democracies. And when we look at all this now, virtually 30 years uh, on or 28 years on, uh, in a completely transformed world, in a completely uh, transformed way of thinking, uh, with new potential unleashed uh, all around the world, with new methods of engagement, uh, with new alignments, uh, if you will, uh, then all this is, does seem a bit of, say, textbook uh, interest. But I think to understand where we are, it's uh, usually, and I'm thankful for you for organizing this, it's, it's usually very useful to know uh, where we were. And, and where we were uh, was usually on different sides of foreign policy issues of the day, or national security issues of the day. Uh, 
where we were versus that there was, whether I know he says that was not the main reason, but I believe it was, uh, we were uninformed about each other. Uh, certainly the US was much less informed about uh, India because I, I know that I, my job was counselor information, which so I knew how much <laughs> I, I had to do uh, to uh, uh, inform people of, of sometimes of very fundamental uh, Indian realities. India, of course, was much better informed about the U.S., but India also had its own uh, sources of mistrust and, and, and suspicion. The IT industry had not yet happened. Uh, the Indian diaspora, the Indian American community uh, was its, in its infancy. Uh, uh, our economy was uh, precarious. And at least from U.S. eyes, it seemed like an, an economy which needed food uh, because we were still living uh, not very far away, uh, less than the time that has elapsed in, from the days I'm talking. We were still not very far away from the PL 480 uh, days. They were very much uh, in, in living memory. Uh, sometimes someone would remind us that, you know, the U.S. was actually very sympathetic to us during our independence movement. Uh, it would, uh, we would be reminded that U.S. had done much for education, investment, agriculture uh, in, in India in the 1960s, and there would be this warm wave of, uh, uh, of, of friendship, uh, and it would sort of soften the edges. But then somebody would come and tap you on the other shoulder and say that, you know, uh, those guys who really don't like India, the U.S. is uh, assisting them. So do you, so then things would sort of uh, break off again. But fortunately, estrangement is not enmity. And uh, it's usually a word which is used for, uh, in the, for spouses. Uh, so in many ways, it presupposes uh, affection, if not love, uh, which, which may have sort of fallen into abeyance uh, for some reason or the other. Uh, so, well, in the 90s, if you ask me, and if I was writing a movie script, uh, these reasons vanished, and this would be the time that you would hear the music begin to rise, and you'd get a few birds on stage to start twittering. Uh, so that, that's exactly what, what, what happened. The Cold War ended. Uh, the offending alliances uh, vanished. Uh, quite unbelievably. Uh, new alignments began to happen uh, globally. Uh, and somewhere there, Ambassador Dennis Cooks ends his book. Uh, after that, what happened would require not a cautious, thoughtful foreign service officer, but a fiction writer to describe that. Uh, 1998 happened. India's wake-up call to the world uh, by way of its, its nuclear tests happened. Uh, and suddenly, uh, people began to wonder, uh, had they missed something? And besides the tests, which they missed, fortunately. <laughs> uh, and of course, they began to have, I mean, the beginnings, as you mentioned, the dialogue. It began as a national, uh, as a security nuclear dialogue, and then it expanded. And, and people began to, with an open mind, uh, Washington began to listen to why India had conducted its nuclear tests. By the way, I arrived in uh, Washington three months after the nuclear tests, and if it had not been for the nuclear tests, I probably would never have been posted to Washington. But that's a time for another story. But that's a story for another time. Uh, so this dialogue began to understand why India tested, what were its concerns that it had. I see Don Camp in the audience, so he knows those days. Uh, the, it, it, it mattered why, why India would worry about two nuclear-armed uh, neighbors uh, sitting on its, on its borders. Uh, why India had been so worried when, in 1995, the NPT was 
um, uh, extended in, indefinitely and without any uh, changes. Uh, why India had not signed on to the CTBT? Uh, it, why its uh, idealism for universal disarmament had been uh, knocked out of court? Uh, laughed out of court, uh, if you go back to the history of the CTBT and see uh, the number of nuclear tests that were conducted by some other countries, even while we were sitting there and negotiating to the VRs uh, of, of the morning. So, and this dialogue then evolved into uh, India's economic potential. The IT industry began to come its, into its own. You remember, those were the days of Y2K. And suddenly, Indian computer engineers began to solve problems and actually set things right all over the United States, and, and we went up in respect. The diaspora had become about one and a half million and was beginning to be heard, uh, not only in companies and in uh, hospitals, uh, but, but also, uh, also on the hill. So that's, that's where it, it all began, and somehow, uh, and I think a couple of years later, the most significant thing that happened in a very tragic event, actually, but it brought us together, was 9-11. Because we had known terrorism and cross-border terrorism and the evils of terrorism for the last three decades before that. But in a very unfortunate way, terrorism was brought transatlantic and, and hit America at home. And I think the kind of understanding and the bonding that created uh, on that has, has, uh, has been a very important factor in, in bringing uh, the two countries together. So 20 years on, if you take it from 98, we are at a point where Prime Minister Modi can stand up in the joint address to the Congress as he did in 2016 and say that we have overcome the hesitations of history. Uh, we are at a time when President Trump can declare that the relationship between India and U.S. has never been stronger, has never been better. Uh, that we can be designated as a major defense partner uh, by the United States. That we can be actually conducting more military exercises with the United States uh, than with any other country. That we can be proclaimed from this stage itself uh, as the other Asian bookend of stability uh, of, of the Indo-Pacific, that we are seen as a huge market. Our middle class will be half a billion strong in 2025. Uh, that we can be seen as a source of professionals, as a source of investment, uh, and, and, and so many other things. And, and a four million strong Indian American community uh, getting stronger in political terms besides, besides the economic terms. And remember, after all that, in addition to that, is that one 70-year-old factor that we are democracies. That there is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multilingual society uh, which sees the world uh, in the same way uh, as, as America does. So how did we get from there to here? I think that needs another book. Uh, and I'm sure either in Delhi or in uh, Washington, these books are being written. Uh, we saw one which said our, our time is here, but I, but I think we, we can do uh, with more. Uh, my take is that, yes, objective uh, changes did take place. Uh, India did unleash its potential through economic reforms and uh, other, other, other uh, changes that global conditions did change to help this. But I think fundamentally what changed was that we opened our minds to each other. That we be began to trust each other and not second guess each other. That we actually began to talk to each other rather than talk at or talk past each other, which we often had done in the past. So, that's where we are, and if this continues, then I think uh, Rick Rosso will be able to organize another seminar, not 20 years later, but per perhaps next year, which says a strange, a strange democracy to natural allies to true friends. Thank you.
Well, I'll go ahead and reserve the room every year uh, this day for the next 20 years, and uh, let's see how cool we can change the names every single time. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Wisner on stage again, you know, from the time and energy that he's put on from the U.S. side on, on trying to shepherd this relationship uh, in government, outside of government, through a variety of roles, a variety of board. Uh, it's just been terrific to get to learn about this country uh, through, through his eyes and through his actions. So Ambassador Wisner, the podium is yours. Rick, thank you very much. That's two introductions. I don't think I can remember ever having had that and being so flattered. Um, and I can assure you I appreciate it. I also appreciated being in the presence of John Hamray today. Uh, John uh, was fortunate enough in my case to serve with John Hamry in the Defense Department, as he noted, but at a really fascinating time. And that was the beginning of our transformation, transformation of our defense establishment from the Cold War to the period after, trying to size it, trying to estimate what the threats to the United States would be in American security. And John was at the heart of that, a terrific strategic mind, and I'm delighted he's running this great institution. Rick, everything you said about me pales in my regard for you and what you've done with the program and the focus and precision that you have given to the India account and also for bringing together today so many very, very good friends. I wish I could acknowledge each and every one of you. I'm afraid I would exhaust my time in doing so, but there is one here that makes me almost um, somewhat teary-eyed when I look at Farooq Shoban. He and I first met in 1974 just outside the Secretariat building in Dhaka, just after Bangladesh's independence. And he was in charge of the relationship with the United States, and I was a stripling officer in the American Embassy. And we've been friends and colleagues ever since. And to find you here today from Dhaka, from Bangladesh, amongst us is really a memory of my lifetime, my service, my time, with South Asia. But it is an appropriate moment for all of us to put our heads together, think about the relationship, decide in our own minds whether it's working for us, whether it's working for India. And I think by the time I conclude today, I hope you will agree with me that I believe both is the case in both regards, though not without issues. Uh, Ambassador Sarna has set the stage perfectly. He's looked over these past years and given the breadth of analysis of what the American and Indian experience was, and I won't try to meet, meet that. My own experience began in the State Department and <clears throat> when I was asked to represent the United States by President Clinton in India. And as I looked at the task that lay ahead of me, I was struck by how narrow our relationship was. We argued with India about non-proliferation. There was precious little trade and investment. Uh, our defense cooperation was still born after a brief attempt at starting some fledgling undertakings during the Reagan period. There was very little. I remember sitting at lunch with President Clinton and Prime Minister Rao when he came to, on his first visit to the United States as Prime Minister, uh, we were sitting around the table in the yellow dining room in the White House, just a few of us, and the conversation flagged a bit. President Clinton, looking for a subject to touch on, so narrow was the range of issues that we had before ourselves in India, and not obviously wishing to pick a fight. He turned to Mickey Cantor, who was then Secretary of Commerce, and said, Mickey, do we have any issues with India? And I must say, I remember Mickey Cantor's face fell as he struggled to come up with it. He said, President, Mr. President, yes, we do. Almonds, the almond trade problem. Well, to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Ambassador, we still are arguing about those almonds, um, and we've survived that period. But there's a lot more to talk about today. 
There's a lot more to talk about as we look out in the years ahead, for this relationship is fundamentally different than it was when I first was introduced to it. And the trajectory is also different. I can look back today, I can look today at the state of the relationship between the United States and India and say that I can't think of another major American international engagement in which it is fundamentally so transformed and better today than it was 20 years ago. Not one matches where we stand today with India. And at the same time, I can say I like it in a way because as much progress as we've made, it's not too warm and it's not too cool. It's just about right in terms of our national perspectives. India's not an ally. India is, in the genuine sense of the word, a partner today with the United States. And why? Because yes, indeed, thank you, Ambassador, you're quite right, because we have basic common interests that we share. In democracy and values, that's all true. But we also see the world of security challenges before us in a similar eye. The Indo-Pacific is an area in which the United States and India both seek a balance of power to make certain that we are both able to deal with the still uncertain factor of the rise of Chinese power. These interests bring us together. Interests as well that are economic as we both seek to secure the welfare of our citizens and progress into the exciting information age that we're entering. And so we're tied together with common interests and common principles. And we've demonstrated it adequately in the growth of our economic cooperation. The numbers are mind-blowing and growing faster every day. And on the defense side, it's equally true that we are in a light years of difference from everything we'd known in the past. But that's not all. Ambassador, I think you mentioned it, the growth of proximity between our two peoples. I re recently was reminded that when Prime Minister Nehru was in office, there were about 3,000 Americans of Indian origin. Uh, when Indira Gandhi came, about 30,000. When Rajiv Gandhi, her son, took over office, there were about 300,000, and they're just under 4 million today. That is a powerful link. And look at who we're talking about our ambassador to the United Nations, our senator from California. And if you look across the land of America in the top ranks of our legal, medical, intellectual, academic professions, business, Indian Americans are in the front ranks. No community has given more or been more successful in our nation's life and no community offers more ballast when the rough waters in any relationship shake the course of the ship of a relationship. So I am absolutely confident as I look forward that the core principles undergirding the relationship are strong and capable of weathering the differences that inevitably two nations will have in the course of any history. I start with the economic perspective. For today, I am confident we can build on solid ground with India. The Indian economy is strong. It's performing well. 7.2% growth rate is pretty darn good in today's terms. And I'm, pretty, I'm also able, I think I reflect a consensus among economists, to look at that rate of growth continuing out over a number of years ahead with inflation having been brought under control, the fiscal deficit managed. I've been struck as well in these recent years by hugely transformative and difficult reforms having been put into practice, tax reforms, and notably demonetization. And now India is taking on a very tough task, which is managing the non-performing assets and bankruptcy provisions of the Indian banking system in business communities. We look, as we look ahead, 
Therefore, we're going to see a stable Indian economy. But we're also likely to see a stable government. I don't predict other people's elections. I do a bad job in predicting my own. But let me tell you, I think I'm reasonably confident whether it's a coalition or a slight majority, I'm able to look ahead and think that 2019 will see Prime Minister Modi back in office and a stable trajectory on which Americans can think politically about our relationship with India. Those two, but think again about security, our defense cooperation. Today, $16 billion with a tough decision lying ahead, the acquisition of India's new aircraft, which India badly needs to introduce, um, new technology transfers, equipment right across the line. We've literally become India's indispensable, indispensable defense partner. And at the same time, we recognize and should recognize that we will not be India's only partner that India's own instincts will be to vary her defense acquisitions and maintain some degree of balance and no degree of over-dependence on any defense supplier. Our ambitions for defense cooperation will be limited by very fundamental facts. India's budget is not everything that even India would like it to be or her chiefs of armed forces staffs would like it to be. It's constrained. Bureaucratic procedures are complex. And the goals sometimes are at variance. India's determination to make an India and acquire defense products can clash and cause great complexities. But I would argue, in addition to economics, and in addition to defense, there's a third area of fundamental cooperation that will continue to bind and develop, it, develop our ties in a strategic manner. And that is the question that I mentioned earlier of China and indeed of relations between India and Pakistan. Here the United States is an indispensable partner with India, con helping to contain the passions of one and helping to manage China's rise to power on the other hand. So we stand today with a fundamental floor of strategic significance under our relationship, one that is certain to grow. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have problems. Of course we're going to have issues that divide us and make the relationship complex. As I look today at questions like uh, Katza and the restraints that some would impose on India because of her acquisition of defense articles from Russia. If I look at the potential of secondary effects of sanctions on Indian oil acquisition from Iran, if I look at charges from our Treasury Department about currency manipulation, if I look at USTR's decision to review GSP benefits, um, for a variety of reasons. I recognize all of those. They're tough issues. They're the issues that keep Ambassador Sarna, Sarna you awake at night and vex Rick Rosso as he tries to figure out how to steer our interests through these shoals, through these shoals. But let me tell you, when I take a step back and I look at these questions, and then I look at the breadth, the direction, of the relationship between the United States and India, I am confident we can manage them, not quickly or easily, and not in a totally satisfactory manner for either side, but they can be managed. They can be managed because the relationship is fundamentally sound. Now, there are probably also some things that we ought to be thinking about to give the relationship fresh meaning, ways of looking ahead, doing things we haven't done in the past. And I won't hold you too long in this regard. And in so doing, however, I will steal shamelessly from Nelson Cunningham's copy book, which he brings to every meeting I see him at. And I'm going to mention two that I think are whole promise and are worth putting all of our minds around. As you reach conclusions this afternoon and in other fora you attend and in other endeavors you undertake. Number one is I have grown a bit weary of the thought of trying to see a free trade agreement 
for good reason. I wish my European friends well. India has some very basic protectionist attitudes, but we seem to be developing them as well. Rather than going down that road, I'd like to think of a partnership in IT between Indian business and American business, led by business, encouraged by governments, in which we look at areas of future development and figure out on the two sides how best we can fund those, how best we can regulate them, how best we can manage taxes to encourage growth. To be able to deal with AI, IT, and the promising and challenging areas of biotech before us. How can our two intellectual and industrial systems come together and elaborate rules of the road that would make growth in this sector and Indo-American cooperation a tangible fact? That's one idea, and I leave it with you. The second idea is one, and I know I can draw a smile, Nelson, from you, because I also believe this is important, and he and I have discussed it at great length. And that is as we look out at the challenge of China. China will not be contained, but China can be competed with. But not if we fail to stand together and figure out how best to compete with China. At the moment, I am watching Chinese, massive Chinese investments in infrastructure across Central Asia, around the periphery, into Southern Europe, into Africa, virtually unchallenged in their totality. And it causes me to think that if this nation had the wisdom to put together a Marshall Plan after 1945, is it impossible for the United States, Japan, Europe, and India to combine our thinking, combine our resources, and come up with an infrastructure development initiative, a bank, if you will, that will deal in responsible infrastructure development. Is it impossible to mobilize those resources amongst ourselves to meet one of the most pressing challenges on the world today, infrastructure development, and offer a competitive model of going forward, a model based on democratic principles, respect for labor rights, respect for the environment, and be able to compete and show the world that we can do just as good a job, but we can do it better cooperatively, and India should be part of that endeavor. So two ideas, I leave them with you, as well as my thanks and best wishes for this seminar and discussion. Thank you, Ambassador Wisner. Um, I've got a few questions for both, and if we still have time, we'll open it up to the, uh, to the floor. First, you know, I want to start a question for Ambassador Sarna. So I think when we, when we talk about, you know, those of us that focus on India, you know, we see progress, we see relationships developing, we see these tremendous aspects of a modern India that we want to partner with and develop, you know, deeper ties with. I think, you know, more, more often than not, India is portrayed by mainstream media across the United States in its least reformed models. You know, you see stories of village life and, and things that just haven't right, quite seen that modernity touched it exactly quite yet. How important is it? I mean, first of all, would you agree with that, that there still needs to be a better reflection of the positive modern aspects? Or do you think that's adequately captured? And if, if you would agree with my perception that it's not, is that important? Can we keep going forward when the American public, by and large, still has a vision of India that is a bit dated? Or is that not so important for the kinds of things we want to see happen, at least from Washington? Rick, uh, I spent my four years the last time in Washington uh, trying to correct this, and uh, I must have miserably failed, uh, <laughs> because we still see a lot of it. Uh, to, uh, yes, I think it is extremely important. Uh, it's important for us, but I think it's important for the United States as well. Uh, to get a correct picture of, uh, even if I was not an Indian, I would say, of a very important country in the world. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 
and I, and I can't tell you, I, suppose, I can guess at the reasons, but I, you know, we, we are somewhat better off today. Uh, uh, people no longer think that we have tigers and elephants walking around on the streets or, or Maharajas hanging around every corner. Uh, of uh, India, carpets, uh, yeah, but boards. I mean, we've moved from that, but we haven't moved much. Uh, I, I think there is a, there is a certain reluctance uh, to focus on, on the positives. Uh, at the same time, I think there is a certain temptation uh, to go for the exotic. Mm. Uh, I, you know, in a world of today, I think the word exotic in the way it used to mean when people couldn't travel or couldn't, couldn't see, that has gone, that's, that's faded, you know. But unfortunately, uh, that is a tendency, uh, I, I must say, for a lot of the mainstream media. Uh, and, I, and I'm at a loss to say why, perhaps because maybe that's the only way they can get news, news space from their editors, uh, you know, that uh, tell a bad story, uh, tell a shocking story, uh, uh, and, and, and get printed. And these are people who are based in, in, in New Delhi. So they, it's not somebody who's just, uh, who's just uh, parachuting for a couple of days and gets it wrong. And these are people who are there for three, four years who have access to, but I think there's a tendency to look at the social exception. You know, okay, there's a dowry case or there is a caste issue. Uh, so pick it up and s splash it, you know. Uh, but if there's a startup story, for instance, oh, that happens everywhere, you know. So I, I think, I think it's, it's a point. Uh, frankly, uh, it bothers me, but I'm, I don't lose sleep over it anymore. Good. I used to. I used to. I would uh, uh, put in uh, letters to the editor. I would try and go and meet people. And now I, I, it's, it's more a case of uh, pity than worry mm. that, you know, India has moved on, you haven't. So, and you are doing your reading public uh, a huge injustice. Somewhere it gets, it also gets, because of technology today, it gets equalized. Because people are seeing reality for themselves. They don't have to wait for the uh, uh, a newspaper. So they're seeing it on social media, they're seeing it on television. It's, it's a much more, uh, it's so, you know, in some ways the paradigm has changed. So, so again, these pieces just sound like oddities. They show the narrow mindset of the, of the, of the journalist or the editor uh, and, and marginalize them rather than marginalize us anymore. So more of a nice to have rather than a must have for moving things forward. I mean, good to have better, you if know, more they modern. Want, if they yeah. want to survive and remain relevant, mm. they, should, they should move. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, Ambassador Wisner, I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, with the elections coming up next year, actually tomorrow we do have the results of a key state election too with yes. Karnataka, you know, the last big state that uh, the Congress party holds. But um, what have you seen, you know, for your many years in, in, in being in the forefront of U.S.-India relations, the impact that elections have not necessarily even a change in government, but you know the focus by political leadership on, 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 on the election itself. Is there always, right before and maybe right after, a bit of a slowdown on what we can do because of that? Or is foreign policy divorced enough from politics where there still is some flexibility? I mean, do things still happen? Or is it that big of a slowdown period as people sometimes portray? No, I know, I, I remember a, a sage American, Bill Fulbright, Senator, uh, trying to teach a group of youngsters like myself about American politics, reminding me in those days that domestic politics are the mother of all foreign policy. And if I ever had reason to doubt Fulbright uh, then, I certainly can't today, mm. uh, where we find ourselves enmeshed in political calculations dominating even our foreign policy agenda. But that's to talk about this country. There is no question in the highly competitive environment that India presents to itself in the world that as you approach an election, the pace of a government's willingness to step out on the stage and take on tough decisions is limited. 
And that isn't to say that India doesn't have a lot of tough questions to solve. Uh, like any country, jobs, income disparity, health, education, skilling, all these questions are questions that the Indian government has got to address and some have very practical legislative consequences. I think, for example, land allocation being one. But I recognize in the year before a general election and having lived through several in my time as ambassador in India, things slow down. That's a fact. And it's a natural fact of the democratic process. But they also can spring back to life when a new government comes in and wants to set a record and then have to secure that record through the uh, instance through the parliamentary processes that are available to it. So I am actually, I am struck by what I said from the podium, and that is for the first time I feel comfortable I'm looking at a strong and stable government going forward. Uh, there may be a bit of a coalition, but it'll be the first time in years that I have known Indian politics that the center will have the same projection of strength and will therefore seek and have the ability to accomplish some of the key objectives that need to be accomplished. So yes, there may be a bit of a slowdown between now and 2019, but I think the chance of a rebound after 2019 is considerable and that rebound will affect the vital interests of American business as well as American state policy. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to open up to the audience just to have one more question I'll throw it to my, uh, to my speakers up here, to both of you, um, and, and see about a quick response to this, or maybe there is no quick response to it. But, you know, looking back at 1998, um, you know, the, the focus so much on trying to dehyphenate the relationship India-Pakistan, and, you know, seeing even on revo you know, removing the nuclear sanctions that we were told at the USIBC, who was kind of leading the charge in the lobbying effort, that it had to be a package, you know, the, the ability to remove sanctions on both at the same time simultaneously. Um, now, you know, China comes up so often there. Is, is there a concern, um, and, and, and for, for the U.S., is it, is it correct, to, to try to put India and China back on the same page? Is there a rehyphenization that's taking place right now, or do you think that the relationship and what we're presenting is broad enough where it shouldn't be defined like that as it sometimes is? I, I think these are two very different uh, uh, situations and uh, uh, they are not parallels, mm -hmm. uh, honestly speaking. I mean, the India-Pakistan hyphenation was something which was, you know, you saw India and Pakistan as, as, as uh, uh, two almost equals uh, or, and, and creating uh, problems for the rest of the world because they, they had, a, had an issue and you saw everything that you did with India of how things would be, should be done with Pakistan. Or, or vice versa, or sometimes not vice versa. But uh, ultimately, that hyphenation broke because of, uh, I mean, reality broke it. Yeah. Uh, in, India became, uh, you know, something which, which the U.S. had to take on its, on its uh, own, own, own thing. Uh, today, I don't think anybody seriously thinks that, you know, they can see the relationship in that part of Asia uh, as, as, as a, as a uh, you know, India versus China or India-China. Uh, equation, because then I, I, I don't think there is a serious uh, 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 a danger of that, because it would be, frankly, it would be absurd. You know, I, I'm not going to add a, a great deal to what the ambassador just said. I, I think there's even another fact that has been in my mind now for a number of years I, that represents a real change in the American outlook. Um, for many years in the post-Cold War period, we regarded it as an American responsibility, if not right, to try to settle other people's problems. <laughs> that we had to get in the middle of problems in order to make a difference to preserve peace, to whatever our, to preserve a common front against the erstwhile Soviet Union. And that led us down some awkward paths. Among those awkward paths was a view the United States had to have a position on Kashmir, the United States had to have a position on India and Pakistan, the United States therefore needed to have equal standing in both courts, and that died. A realization that 
in this sense, the only parties that are going to be able to manage the Indian-Pakistan question are India and Pakistan. We can all wish them well, and we can worry about the situation. We can have quiet dialogues on both sides, but we're not in that, in that game. That's not an American responsibility. On the other hand, the global question of the rise of Chinese power is a matter of joint concern to the two nations. And that will not just be settled between Beijing and Delhi or Beijing and Washington, but can only be managed with a sharp eye on creating a balance between a rising China and the international order that surrounds it. And that means India, it means Australia, it means Japan, it means Indonesia, Malaysia, the literal nations around China and the United States all have a responsibility to live and trade with China, yes, but also to manage our, our political and security needs with China. And here we in India have to think together and have to, in fact, act together. And what we are doing now is without going too far and being intrusive in the relationships each of us have with Beijing, it's clear our relationship permits each of us to send signals to Beijing. I watched, for example, recently, Ambassador, you'll forgive me, you can disagree with me, the Prime Minister traveled to China. I saw that as a decision on his part that reflects the strength of his confidence in the American relationship. That it enables him to move and sit at the table to buy time and space in his relationship with China. The American relationship enables stability mm -hmm. between India and China. And I think that's just incredibly important. But whether we say it explicitly to one another or implicitly, the connection of our interest is common. Oh, that's great. Well, we're going to have to uh, wrap up the opening session here, but please join me in thanking our two terrific speakers to get today's program kicked off. Thank Ambassador, you. yes, sir.